mention that I end the conference just with a few words, which surely will not last 15 minutes. Um, we have had our this conference now, and all these conference events. I had the pleasure to close them in the end. I mean, what a conference was that? It was a bit more, he told me, but hopefully nobody else was. No, it was really, really great. I was a bit frustrated, a bit burned out just before with all these trials, and I'm here, and hundreds of people, and so much energy, and so many people so deeply thinking about things. And, you know, I get the feeling it's so matured, the movement, you know. Uh, not to be little, idealistic, small groups, but 30 years ago, what a tiny little bunch of people who were holding placards and dressing up like carrots, and now <laughs> there is so much science going into this, so much pragmatism, so many people all over the place. Um, it was really cool. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't go to all talks. I would not love to, but maybe this is why they go online later. So, um, yeah, it was really much to think about and really to newly adjust our campaigns and to learn about the movement. I also learned something in the last but one talk that we are a gender free, multicultural, safe space to cuddle. Which uh, is a nice description, isn't it? But it is um, by our enemies, it's not um, ourselves, but I think we can. We can agree with that, isn't it? Yeah, um, I promised to have a little look back. I feel a bit, it's also of my role, um, as probably some others here also, but I've been active for, for how long? 32 years. And um, yeah, I, I want a bit share of stories and experiences I had um, uh, before they just drowned and uh, sort of lost in time and space. Um, <clears throat> my biggest worry that I carried with me coming to the conference was um, that we are in the movement in a sort of hamster wheel. You know the hamster wheel? It's like in the old days when we caged hamsters, there was a wheel and the hamster went in there and it just ran the wheel and all. Just instead of getting along, it always turned and it came to the same point back. And indeed, if you look back, there has been an animal rights movement for a very long time. There has been a vegan movement for a long time, and there has been ecological criticism of animal products for a very long time. And some of you might not um, might not realize how long that is. Not that it's my personal experience, but um, 1824, Louis Gompertz wrote this famous little booklet. It is published afresh, so you can actually get it in the bookshop, called Moral Inquiries. It's not very long. Maybe 60, 70 pages, but it has all arguments that nowadays are put forward for animal rights. Moral inquiries. And um, he actually promotes veganism, he talks about honey, and what is particularly impressive is that in his day and age, there was no other way to move around than with horse carriage. But he was totally opposed to horse carriages because they abused horses and uh, dominate it. So he essentially said, you have to walk on foot yeah, if you're vegan. Um, so <clears throat> fortunately, we don't have to do that today. But the um, fact is that 1824 was the time when these thoughts were put forward first. And after that, a lot of other such um, books and items and ideas came up. The most famous, uh, Henry Ford, 1891, which was a book that had already animal rights in the title. For ecology, I found this guy, Charles Carey, who wrote in 1830 that actually we have to stop using animal products because they are just a waste of natural resources. And eventually we have to sort of switch to plant-based products, otherwise um, the ecology of the planet will collapse. He wrote it in 1830, so there is not particularly new um, input if we come up with these ideas today. And also veganism and vegetarianism have a very long history, obviously, in that old um, Greek um, uh, philosophers already came up with this, but in the more modern days, um, there is a guy called Gustav Struve from Germany who participated in 1848 in the revolution and wrote a book about plant-based diets. 
um, called Pflanzenkost. And just a few years later, in 1860, a guy who is then called the father of vegetarianism or veganism, uh, Eduard Becker, I don't know, uh, also um, just uh, triggered this movement off towards veganism and vegetarianism. And indeed, it was not totally non successful. Um, it was the sort of what I would now call the first wave of our movement. Um, you can find in Berlin in 1895 already 18 vegetarian restaurants, and in 1910 there were already 200 vegetarian restaurants in Germany. There was indeed a B level for vegetarian products more than 100 years ago. There was plant meat, cold plant meat, there was plant sausages, there was plant down, plant butter, plant milk, plant leather, and all these things were advertised in newspapers. and. Um, and so they were essentially vegan. Many of those products were vegan. And there was, the term vegan was known, it was only invented in 1944 later, but it was used as strict vegetarian. And, um, and so, so people essentially did promote veganism 150 years ago. What is a bit worrying also is that they actually said, after there were 200 vegetarian restaurants in Germany, they actually said that in the year 2000, everybody will be vegetarian. We will have a peaceful, um, non-animal exploitative society. And what did we have in 2000? It wasn't at all so. Uh, in reality, there was a First World War, and this First World War shifted values. Um, the vegetarian societies lost lots of membership, and, uh, but the majority of people were forced to become vegetarian or even vegan because um, animal products were really available. In between the wars, there was a radicalization of the voices. There was a lot happening, actually. Um, uh, just before the war, actually, there was the, the vivisection movement strong in England. I forgot to mention that there was actually, it's well known, um, street fights over vivisection. There was this old brown dog riots, which went down in the history books. Uh, two Swedish <coughs> women were in the veterinary uh, university and did, um, so with their own eyes, um, experiments on the old brown door, and um, <coughs> managed to get um, a monument up in the street, I think in Liverpool, and the big sectors, especially the students, wanted to remove that, so there was street fighting on this, and sadly the big sectors won, but uh, the monument is now there again, it came, I think, uh, at the end of the 20th century. But there was street fights, and not just that, there was huge big demos for animal rights in Vienna, um, if you go through the archive of the oldest Austrian Animal Protection Society, you find that in 1927 there was a demo in Vienna with 8,000 participants demanding animal rights. Um, so, and then the Second World War essentially killed all this and it was more or less forgotten. Um, during the um, <coughs> shortages in the First World War, meat became another luxurious ideal, and these movements were forgotten and their ideas uh, essentially buried until they were recovered by people who sort of um, went through the old archives of vegetarian um, associations. <clears throat> so are we in a hamster wheel? Are we now doing veganism, vegan outreach? Are we do? Uh, animal welfare, animal rights, um, political campaigning, and in 100 years, somebody will stand here and say, you know, actually, that 100 years ago, they did campaigning. <laughs> the second wave of animal campaigning started in 1963 with the foundation of the HSA, the Hans Saboteurs Association, and in 1970, as we all know, I suppose, Richard Ryder coined the term speciesism, and from then, it went on with the 1975 book by Peter Singer and the ideas by Tom Regan, the early 80s. And um, um, not as a coincidence that happened in England, and it triggered um, a very revolutionary flair. It might be, or it was surely, that in other countries there was uh, also intense activity, but my recalling of the story is obviously uh, subjective. I had the opportunity to go to England in the late 1980s uh, as a scientist, actually for climatology, 
Um, in those days, you were belittled, even as a scientist, if you said climate change is coming. We did calculate that, and it was definitely uh, foreseeable. I actually went with the data here to Austria and showed it to the politicians, and they showed me the door. Um, we could have started doing something against it um, at least 20 years earlier than we did. But there was a revolutionary flair, and it actually gripped me from the very first day. I arrived in England and uh, was looking for contact, and there was this poster, and it said, Animal Welfare versus Animal Warfare. And I thought, oh God, what's that about? <laughs> I did go there, uh, and I was in the audience, and there was a debate by an RSPCA officer versus some person who said out there he smashes windows <laughs> in order to promote um, animal rights. And um, then they asked the audience, so who here is um, vegetarian? And I proudly raised my arm. <laughs> but I was the only one. And I said, OK, the English are backwards like everybody uh, like at home. And then he asked, who is vegan? And woof, all the arms went up. And I said, <laughs> who are they? <laughs> what is vegan? <laughs> Anyway, um, what I did then was join the groups immediately on the next day. I had my first arrest. I was um, blockading the entrance of Boots, the Vivi sector. And um, in the way there, I was sitting in, in the car um, with a woman who then, well, I don't know, she was a pretty well-known activist. She had to go to prison as well later. And um, she sat with me, uh, so she on the driving seat. And uh, she said, are you vegan? And I said, I don't know what he is. And she said, <laughs> and I said, I'm vegetarian, you know, I'm vegetarian. <laughs> and she said, what, you're eating the menstrual products of chickens? And she said, no, I don't want to. <laughs> anyway, in that moment, I turned vegan, never eat menstrual product. <laughs> yeah, so I dived in. And it was a heyday of animal rights, really. I mean, there's surely some people here who have been active then there as well. And it was a heyday, wasn't it? It was so much happening all over the place. And it was uh, radical, and it was such an atmosphere, mood of revolution. It was really impressive. Um, and then, for me, pretty soon being there, a very tragic thing happened. And I want to share that story with you because I'm an eyewitness of it. And I don't want it to be forgotten. It's a sad and tragic story of a young boy, 15-year-old guy, called Tom Warby. We were sabbing, as we called it, the Cambridgeshire foxhounds. This was a hunt um, in this traditional aristocratic sense in England. They were all up on horseback. And they had a pack of hounds, as they called it, 40, well, 20 couple, they called it, so 40 dogs. and. Um, they were chasing foxes for that every Tuesday and every Saturday. And I made a point of um, chasing them every time and siding with the fox. I found that bit, before I come to the tragic side, I uh, find that bit always strange, you know, that I'm, um, we are sort of the five saps of us supporting the fox. And he's trying to shout, shouting me, why do you hassle us? And I say, you know, there are 150 riders, 50 people who, on, on cars following it and 40 dogs and one fox and the five of us on his side. Do you find that unfair, really? Um, but uh, they were very aggressive to us. They were very violent. And we had very little support by the public, mostly because there was this revolutionary atmosphere. And we lived in a revolutionary bubble. We only met amongst each other. We only said to each other, wow, that and that has to happen. And it's normal. And it's uh, important. And it came so far that um, yeah, most radical activities were found, um, were, were felt as being completely mainstream. Um, <clears throat> OK, coming back to this tragic situation, we were um, out with this hunt until the beginning of April, which is the end of the hunting season with the fox. And the very last day was the 3rd of April, 1993. And we were there. Um, our little Cambridge SAP group supported by a number of other groups from the nearby towns because their hunts had um, closed for the season. And with us came a young boy called Tom Warby. He came with his girlfriend. And he was out for the first time. And he didn't look like 15. Otherwise, we might have questioned it coming out with us. But you know, this was not um, 
a national organization. This wasn't you asking people for addresses and uh, uh, something you're just uh, happy if people join you and, and help you. And on this day, it was a pretty lot of um, uh, early April sunny day, pretty warm. We um, went to the hunt and the 40 of us stood there and said no hunting today. And one policeman came, the hunter called them, and he said 40 is too much for me and left. And so the hunters were faced with either we chase them around or they pack up for the season and that pissed them off really. They're very arrogant folk, I have to say. Um, one of those riders um, said to me, I will remember it always, he called Joffrey Fox, which is a bit ironic, chasing foxes and being called foxes. But anyway, he, um, he said to me, my golden button on my jacket is worth more than you will ever earn. And that was um, the attitude that these people had to us. Anyway, coming back to that fateful day, um, the hunters decided to pack it up. I believe this guy, Fox, who was the master of the fox hounds, he said, we pack it up. But the main huntsman was pissed off about that. He wanted to hunt, and, but he was sort of employed by these fox and his other masters. And so he was angry. And he packed the horses into this horse carriage and the 40 dogs um, in the upper area of this van and drove off. And we didn't know, is he driving off um, into the next hunting territory or is he um, <coughs> going home? So uh, the people, while they were walking back to the road across this dirt track, um, went slowly in front of the van so that they could catch up in case he's driving to the next hunting area um, and join in the cars. I ran forward and stood at the roadside and looked straight back at this van coming towards me. In front of him was this bunch of people. And he nudged them on, drove into them and roared his engine until they sort of went to the right and left. And then he uh, put down the gas pedal and he went on very fast this dirt track. And the dirt track was, in, um, was cornered by, uh, by a hedge, a very rigid hedge on one side and a, and a furrow and a furrow on the other side. So a steep um, slope thing where they gather the water from the, from the fields. And there were four people just in front of him. And they counted on this guy being human and respecting humans, uh, but he didn't. He drove straight into them. And they realized that in the last second and three of them jumped to the ditch and the other one was caught between the hedge and the van. And he was clinging on to the side mirror and banging on the door to stop. And this guy drove on. And then he suddenly lost the grip and was flying against the hedge and then back underneath the lorry. And I, I, it was not further away than the wall there. I saw the van lifting up slightly when he was driving over the head of this boy. He was driving at us and then leaving. We went to this guy and he was conscious. He was bleeding out of the nose, out of the eye, out of the ears. His uh, girlfriend took him and held him. And then came the lurid statements of the hunters. They surrounded us laughing. And um, then he died, there and then. And um, in the wake of this, we, we felt that uh, we have to be able to get them to court. This was murder, and this was not just murder. He also fled the scene of the crime. If it was an accident, he should have stopped. Um, <clears throat> it came to a trial, a so-called coroner's court, where they decide if this is an accident or if it's murder. And we had 40 witnesses, and we thought, we all have seen it. That must be a clear-cut case. But um, the coroner, the judge um, take the, took the piece out of us. One after the other said, how do you look? What, you have colored hair. What do you think in front of a court? You, can you take your hands out of your pocket? He was just calling us a mob and calling us a menace in the countryside. And then he said, accidental death. There is no case to answer. This murderer can go. So what do you do in that case? If, um, the law just drops you in. You can't, they can, they can kill you, and you can't do anything about it. Um, what happened was that the movement reacted with anger and passion and um, 
violence. This kennels were smashed up, this van was burned down, and the movement got uh, very angry. Um, understandably, I think. But um, in some sense, it was a dead end road. We are, after all, a tiny segment of the social uh, of society, and um, and there is this big outside um, world with uh, all power they need, with police, with their surveillance, with their manpower, with their technology, and it had to end. Um, had to end with a strong repression. Um, and there's one last episode that sort of has a bit to do with this case that I want to remind us all of here also before I come to a more happy ending. And that is a guy called Barry Horn. I'm not sure if you know him. I'd, I'd love to know who, who has heard of Barry Horn. Can you lift your hand? Very few. You see, um, we have such an overturn, isn't it? Lots of n young, new people coming, and the older ones burning out, smashing their head against the wall. So we sort of lose this history. And so I want to briefly tell you about Barry Horn as well. To this day, 16 years ago, he died in a prison cell. And he died in a hunger strike, in a hunger strike for animal rights. He began, as his uh, life story says, as a dustbin man, but joined the movement with one famous action in 1988 when he actually liberated a dolphin from a dolphinarium, which is a really brave action. He went in there, got the dolphin on his little carrier, and carried him to the sea. <laughs> Quite impressive. In 1990, he's also famous for being part of a larger group that actually liberated 82 beagles and 14 or 17 rabbits. So he was a very brave guy, and I met him, I had quite a bit to do with him. He came from Northampton and we were joining uh, forces when we were sabbing. I remember one particular personal story with him. Um, we were sabbing the so-called Yetni mink hounds. They have hounds and until 1976 they chased otters and these otters when they were all um, getting rare and extinct they switched with the same hounds and the same hounds to mink who had fled from fur farms. And so they were hunting mink week after week in the summer days, from April till August. This is the time to, to sort of fill this desperate space when there is no hunting before the next fox hunting season starts. So they are so desperate for this that they hunt this tiny little mink again with 40 dogs. And, um, and it was him and me alone. And um, this was a pretty violent hunt. And I, um, and yeah, and we ran around the hunt and stood on one side and sat in a, in a bush. And we saw the mink running out and then we saw the dogs coming. And uh, this is the moment where you have to act or never because the dogs then surround the mink, the mink might go on a tree and then they see this mink and then the mink, the days sort of the, uh, are numbered. So are the minutes for the life of this mink. So uh, we had to act, but there was all these thugs coming behind the dogs. And I said, I'm shitting my pants. And then he said to me, no, um, there's no place for shitting your pants. This is about life and death. I'm not backing down. Then he stood up and ran there screaming, and I followed him. Um, <clears throat> we did save the mink. The mink escaped. We, we could hold the dogs back, which just stood in front of them, and they're very scared of humans. They're probably beaten by these hunters all the time. So we shouted them to stay back and to stop, and they did and the mink escaped, and then the thugs came. Yeah, we sort of survived it, but um, there were a number of uh, encounters with uh, a bit less, uh, with, yeah, with a bit less um, good ending. Um, but uh, Barry Horn eventually was uh, arrested and put in prison for burning places down that were connected with um, animal abuse. He received 18 years prison sentence, which was a record by that time. Um, nobody had received that much prison time. And it was a shock that went through the movement. Suddenly, we were terrorists. Until then, that wasn't so. And um, suddenly, we got these fines in the size of terrorism. And yeah, I knew him as a person who wouldn't back down. So what will he do 18 years in the prison cell? And what he did was go on hunger strike. He said, 
the government, which was a labor government then, the government had promised to re, um, rethink or review the practice in vivisection, and he only demanded that there is a commission set up for that review, so that there's a new potential vivisection law, which sounds harmless as it gets. But the government more or less refused, and he was in hunger strike then for eventually 68 days. I've been in prison, and I have been on a hunger strike for 39 days. I was force-fed. I was um, twice falling unconscious. I know a bit how that feels, but 68 days. He lost his eyesight, he lost his hearing, liver collapsed, and eventually he died. He died uh, 16 years to this day. And I think whatever you feel about arson in defense of animals, he never hurt a human and an animal by doing this. The judge as much as agreed to that in his verdict, but he called him an urban terrorist. Um, I think it's worth remembering him and his, his sacrifice for the cause. Not to say that we should do the same, but what we could learn obviously from him is his bravery. Um, in the sight of the of these scary thugs, still sticking out for the weak and those who are threatened. And I find that very impressive and it keeps inspiring me. And that mm, makes me want to uh, remember this man and his fate um, again and again, especially in front of new people who joined the movement. But um, <clears throat> eventually, this revolutionary movement in England was crushed um, by repression. Um, and <clears throat> you hear very little of that kind of activity. More than a thousand people altogether in England alone were put in prison for animal rights. More than a thousand people. You could ask yourself, would you be prepared to go to prison for animal rights? That's quite a big thing to do. Um, <clears throat> not saying that's a good strategy, but um, I'm saying that this is, um, this is brave. But what I see today is that this type of activity, which had caught on from the English example in other countries, has died down. The ELF activity has died down, has mostly ended actually. I recently read animal liberations by the ELF in Britain, and the last recorded event was, I think, 2009. So it had died down, and you could obviously say mm, that might mean people are scared, the, they are not as brave anymore. You could say, the repression had an effect, but you could also uh, ask um, maybe, maybe we as a movement have um, matured so much that we have uh, become big and effective. And if you join the movement, you don't feel like a lost cause where you just have to freak out and do, the, um, do things that, uh, that are sort of considered from the outside as a severe criminal offense. Um, you don't have to do them anymore in order to have an effect. And um, <clears throat> indeed, we are a lot more people than then. We are uh, uh, active in a lot more countries, and we have a, a long list of successes that might um, actually explain the fact that this kind of ALF activity is not happening anymore, um, or at least in that amount. Um, in England, these days, there were three attacks every day. So it was really high-scale activity. And um, yeah, that is not so anymore. And one can see that in a positive way. Um, it is maybe a sign of our maturity. There's also a new tactic that developed in the early 2000s, which was this inspections or investigations, these large scale investigations of factory farming. Actually, if we talk hunt, um, hamster wheel and compare to the situation 100 years ago, then um, there is a new phenomenon that came up, that is this factory farm. A factory farm didn't exist in the first wave of our movement. Um, there was actually this, the fact that the vegan product was only half the price of the meat or animal-based product. Nowadays, it's almost the other way around. The factory farm had, has made all animal products so cheap that there's actually sort of an economic benefit for the usual consumer to get it, while 100 years ago it was the other way around. But on the other hand, we have very powerful pictures, and we have heard here on this conference of investigations of this kind of 
industrial uh, complex. And we, we know that with these pictures and with this um, <coughs> material, we can reach the hearts of many people. And indeed, possibly most of us here have actually moved into this um, movement or come into the movement because of, um, because of pictures of factory farms or of live animal transports in these huge amounts uh, that they are transported around everywhere. So these powerful pictures are, after all, also an effective means. Um, when I look at the movement and the latest sort of development, then I see also that there was a rift um, at least around 2007, maybe it was in the wake of this rep state repression that crushed this sort of militant wing of the movement. Um, and uh, this was the debate between abolitionism and reformism. And it took, in my view or my feeling, a very destructive direction. Essentially what it is, is the, um, is the sort of struggle between two kinds of activity. The one is uh, the vegan outreach, where you try to get people to sort of come all the way, bearing in mind that you will reach a tiny percentage of people. And at the same time, there is the approach of demanding much less, having an animal welfare reform, but getting the whole society on board. So either you have sort of 100% of people not going into wild animal circuses anymore, or one to five percent of people who turn vegan. And um, at, at the face of it, if you talk about it like this, you get the impression that these this go hand in hand, isn't it? Just move 100 percent as one step and as many as you can the whole way. Mm -hmm. But the abolitionism reformism debate um, um, uh, led to the situation that the one group wanted to stop the other being active altogether. But I feel, looking at this conference as it is now, as it was today and the last days, um, we have overcome that rift. I get the feeling that there is now, um, <coughs> there's now no such debate left. Um, there were a number of talks on internal cooperation, a very impressive one by the vegan geezer who gave us even a poem um, slamming out uh, into the audience that we should um, tolerate each other's activism and cooperate. And maybe that is also a feature of a maturing movement, isn't it? That if we are so many um, doing so many different things that we sort of drown those who just uh, try to cause rifts. We just so many <clears throat> that this, um, this internal fighting just um, disappears sort of naturally. Um, there is a lot of pragmatism that I felt in this conference, um, and there is a very strong scientific approach these days. A lot of people talking about science. Obviously, with all the science, you shouldn't forget the compassion and empathy that drives us doing what we do, but science, nevertheless, in a good dose, will help us a lot. And um, indeed, for me, that is also a sign of a maturing movement that we have uh, so much scientific basis. Um, there's also a new feature that you cannot compare with 100 years ago, that is this sudden burst of a veggie boom. Um, since later 2009, and now uh, still driving on and not leveling off so far, is, um, is impressive. We uh, created a big niche, and veganism is now known all over the place. Um, this is a, a, word, a word that you can use everywhere, and the tiniest little mountain village, they will know what it is. And um, so we might not have had that big inroads on meat consumption so far, but we have established it as a, as a potential lifestyle and that it does work. And that is for me an, an, a very important feature because it is a lever to get the whole society towards that with the political demand. Um, if this is just a tiny piece of weirdos wearing um, these shoes and <laughs> eating muesli all the time, then um, <coughs> then people will, will think, this is not for me. <laughs> I'm cold, I wear socks. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but in this whole variety that we are, and that these, these products appearing everywhere makes it a normal thing and a possible option. And also that so many people now have vegan children actually proves beyond doubt that this is a viable way of living and having the whole society like that. And that is a new feature that we didn't have 100 years ago, and so are less likely to be, to be forgotten and again buried in, in the history until it uh, sort of comes out as a phoenix of the ashes again. 
Um, <clears throat> there is um, a change in society indeed. Um, since the 60s, 68 and 70s, 80s, where there was so lively campaigning and demonstrating the powers that be have um, developed a number of weapons of keeping us in check. Um, there is um, really almost year after year new restrictions on demonstrating there is ever more um, strict laws and um, there is um, uh, surveillance that has increased so much that nowadays you, you're sort of aware that if you drive to a demo and the state wants to know, then they will know that you drive to a demo. And that might not be what most people want to have. There's a number of examples where um, it was um, seen that this could be detrimental for whatever you want to do later. Um, one example that I like to quote, there was a woman activist with us and she for some reason wanted to become policewoman, um, and she went to an interview, and this uh, interview said to her, um, you have been on 18 animal rights demos, we don't want you as a police officer. Um, so she couldn't become one, um, <clears throat> but that shows that um, if you do go to demos, with the surveillance they have on us now, they will know, and they might uh, prohibit or prevent certain future prospects for you. Um, so that, that might suppress radicality for us as well, but um, it, that can be counterbalanced with mass activity and lots of people getting involved. Indeed, the environmental movement, there is a revival of civil disobedience activity, and it might well be there is a revival in the animal rights movement as well. I would uh, draw a clear distinction between that and this um, ALF activity in the revolutionary Britain of the 1980s and 1990s. Also, you could say today we have social media, which wasn't the case 100 years ago, so you could reach people very easily. But social media is a two-sided thing. This is now owned by a monopoly of um, American um, companies who actually can mold our opinion and prevent, without us realizing, that our messages go somewhere. And they can actually make opinions so much so that we those are being um, becoming American presidents. And um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, social media is good in some sense, but bad in some sense. We'll see where that leads to. But there's another big difference 200 years ago and that we, are, that we have become such a big international movement. Everywhere on the globe, really, there is now veganism, there is now activity. Um, if you have heard the very impressive talk about the Belarusian activity, um, this is a dictatorship, the last one in Europe, there is death penalty there, you are not allowed to demo or, or, or do info stalls, but they're still active there and there's still veganism there, there's still uh, something going on which is really, really impressive. Um, we have also achieved a lot of law changes that have not been achieved a hundred years ago. We heard in this um, conference our achievement against the hunting enclosures and the releasing of uh, bred birds just in the last years, then uh, the Czech Republic with their incredibly smart campaign to get a ban on, on fur farming. Slovenia, we've heard, um, they even have a ban on hunting in order to retrieve uh, fur, which uh, I'm not sure it exists anywhere. Croatia has told us about the new ban on kill shelters, so there is a ball rolling here, and I'm, I can't see how that will be undone. You know, if you have a reform step that comes through public pressure, it normally is never dismantled. I have a few experiences that I, I couldn't quote many experiences of that kind. So I think that this is also a one-way road that they can't so easily pull, push back. There's also a uh, strong pressure that we can exert these days on companies to stop um, trading, especially in our case now with cage eggs. There is this big um, alliance um, led by the Humane League in the US that has um, triggered so many such campaigns and put such a pressure on companies that I must say there is, um, there is also a good future prospect if you look at that. I mean, following this example with cage eggs, we could use uh, other animal products and do the same sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> what I a bit worry is that we have um, still a small political foothold, animal welfare, animal rights, animal protection is not really a topic in a normal politics. This is also a backdoor, sort of backbench topic, but it is n almost never mentioned in 
electoral campaigns. So there is a lot to be done there still. Uh, possibly even for many of us, uh, we do not vote on the basis of animal um, welfare programs of parties. Maybe we should. Maybe we should make it clearer and, and uh, propagate more this idea that with the electoral vote you can actually do politics and if there's no other way of achieving further inroads in animal rights, then we possibly should make the election also um, a campaign target. I should also not forget all the school AR education. Um, we had also talks here, we've been doing it since 1995. In many countries this is existing. So this is also something that um, I find uh, very positive in comparison to 100 years ago where the movement was um, more um, of this uh, a very elitist um, um, affair because uh, the society wasn't democratic and it wasn't easily to, to reach people. And uh, yeah, and it was um, <clears throat> those citizens um, in, in the cities who, who had the opportunity to have enough space and enough money to actually publish their own material or uh, fund themselves doing talks, they could do that. But there weren't these big organizations as today that can do this. Um, this outreach. So I'd say there is a lot of um, light on the horizon. I think there is a lot of pos uh, positive signs. And so I would ask you with all potential negativity of right-wing election results to take the inspiration of this um, conference with you and, um, and bring it back home and just inspire all the other activists around you so that um, there is this movement rolling and we can um, we can uh, develop even more in these positive directions. Um, one sort of last important point for me is um, I would just ask you, almost beg you, to stay in the movement. One of the biggest problems we have is the loss of ac activists. I understand that you'll easily burn out and I understand that it's sort of hard work and hard to overcome um, all this stress that you're faced with. But um, imagine with all these new people coming in and the old people staying, how rapidly we would increase. We have such a high turnover. I think every year almost 60, 70 percent of people are new. If, we, if, if, if you, <laughs> as you're sitting here, if you just stayed long enough, um, we would possibly be able to say in 2001, like they did 100 years ago, we will have a vegan world. Um, so, see you next year in Praha, 2018. Thank you.